please, we are going to start. I'll leave the light open. I think it's better. So thank you for joining us uh, tonight. This is a special edition of the Beta Group when we have the opportunity to have um, entrepreneurs coming from the US. We always try to bring them in the room here and uh, get to meet you, explain their experience. And this is actually a very special occasion because Xavier is actually from Belgium. He lives in San Francisco. He presented the first project at the Beta Group number, I mean, five, they had the year four years ago. Four years ago, was it? Yes. Yeah. Just four years ago, I think, in October 2008. And he couldn't uh, make it possible here, so he went to the US and, uh, and a lot has changed. He is going, he's going to explain his uh, whole experience. So this beta group session is made possible thank you to our sponsor, which are the Brussels region, Belfius, uh, Campbell, Ogon, High Media, uh, who else? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that's it. and also, well, um, here, just to make a brief parenthesis, here you're in a, is it your first time in this building? Raise your hands, yeah? Yes. So this is actually an incubator owned by the Brussels region and the Beta Group, uh, we have, uh, I mean, uh, we are actually operating a co-working space here. Ramon is the manager. Ramon, do you want to introduce and eventually? Uh, I think that the best would be to talk with you on a one-by-one -one basis. Me and Stefania would be here. There's some of our members, Xavier, one of our honorary members, of course, but you can see uh, Gilbert, Jonas, and some others around. Uh, we're just opening, managing this space because we felt it was something that the community of the Beta Group members was asking for, and it looks like uh, it's working nice. So yes, uh, we did uh, nail it this time. Um, looking forward to have lots of questions. We have uh, set up here the flyers with all the information, and also free day passes, so you can come and test it yourself. So basically, there are 150 uh, tech guys working in the co-working and uh, smaller offices downstairs with uh, tiny tech startups. So, Xavier, thank you very much for joining us tonight. And uh, let's start. I think it's about 30 minutes, 40 minutes, then question and answers. I guess there will be many of them. Thank you very much for taking your time. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jean. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, so hi, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be here. As the Jean was saying, I was here like uh, it's four years ago already. Time flies. It's amazing uh, at the Beta Group, and I'm a huge fan of the Beta Group and the Beta Co-op. If you're not a member yet, you should definitely do that. It's a uh, really a great place. <laughs> so uh, first, I want to present you what Storyfy is is all about to make sure that everybody knows uh, what we are talking about here, and then I'm gonna talk about um, how did I get there. And, uh, and then I'll open up to questions and answers, and I think that's probably going to be the most, uh, I want that to be interactive, that's probably going to be the most interesting part of it. So please prepare your questions, and I'm really happy and open to answer all of them. Um, so first of all, like, who knows what Storyfy is? Who doesn't know, maybe it's a bit easier. Who has already published a story on Storyfy? Cool, still a few, but too many have not done so, so uh, you should give it a try and, uh, and, and tell me what you think. So, basically, first let me introduce like, um, myself uh, and the team. Um, so, I'm originally from Belgium, <laughs> funny enough, and uh, from the French-speaking part, as you can probably hear, and uh, I'm an engineer in computer science from Louvain-la-Neuve, and um, so I've always been passionate about um, news, technology, and so on. And I moved to the US three years ago um, with my girlfriend, which is now my wife. Um, and basically, um, uh, this is my partner, my, my co-founder, is, is an American guy, um, Bert Herman, and he used to be a reporter for the AP uh, for 12 years. He was reporting. Uh, embedded to the Marines in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in South Korea, um, in all the TAN countries, so Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and whatever TAN country out <laughs> there. Uh, and so, like me, uh, uh, we are both like really passionate about this new world that is opening in front of our generation, which is this new world where everybody on this planet is connected. And we are really passionate about how can we tell the world what's happening in all those different remote places. And the huge opportunity that we have now is that 
we are all connected in real time. So we can know in real time what's going on in all those places. Uh, and actually, this is, I really love this picture. It's actually been released by Facebook in 2003. And this is mapping all the relationships on Facebook um, as in 2003. So, and since then, they reach a billion users now. So it's even much more impressive than that. Um, <coughs> but I think this is that an amazing iconic image in the same way that the, the first image of the planet Herb that we saw in 1964, uh, you know, that was the very first time for humanity to see our planet from, from the moon, uh, was also an iconic image for another generation to think about, wow, we are living in one planet, we better protect it. And that's how the ecological movement started. And I think this is for our generation also an iconic image that we are now all connected, we can all share information um, and we can all work together. And so for our case, for Bert and I, we, since we are really passionate about um, information, news, and so on, we really wanted to find a better way to tell the world what's happening, you know, from the Arab Spring in Egypt uh, to what's happening right now in Syria, or to what's happening with Occupy Wall Street in New York, uh, or, you know, even next door, when there is a, a demonstration. Uh, for example, you cannot have a reporter at every corner of the street but there is always going to be someone with a smartphone and access to Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, you name it, to, to report what's going on. And so that's really what we wanted to do. Um, and for example, like this guy in, in Pakistan, without knowing it, he was actually live tweeting the, repar the reparation that led to the, the, to the killing of Osama bin Laden. Um, and so, I mean, that's amazing. I mean, it really shows that uh, the best reporter is not um, the professional one. It's, it's like a camera, basically. It's the best camera is not the best, most expensive camera. It's the one that we have with you when you need to shoot a picture. And here's the same thing. The best reporter is not the one that has been trained for years and years. No, it's the one who happened to be at the right place at the right time, like this guy. And so this is amazing because it can really give you a new perspective on the events. And so the questions become, OK, how can we make sure that uh, you are probably not following this guy because this guy, you really don't care about following that person on social media. But that day, during the operation that led to Osama bin Laden's <coughs> killing, uh, it was kind of really mind blowing to be able to see uh, close to real time what this person over there was reporting. Uh, another example of that is not only it's this new you know, network where everybody is connected and everyone can be a reporter is not only great because you can have access to remote places, but also for places that are next next door. Um, for example, here that was a year ago, it was the Joplin tornado in the United States. Uh, and this would have been um, here just a classic image of a church being destroyed. And that would have been taken by a normal reporter an hour after the fact and telling you uh, in the newspaper that the, the church has been destroyed. And this is just a fact. Now, the interesting thing in this new world of social media is that this is actually not just a fact. It's actually a picture that has been taken by a human being who is not a professional reporter, who is someone who lives there. And he's saying, this is where I got married and where my best friend's kid went to school. And so now, all of a sudden, it's, it's not just a fact. It's something that touches you, can, that can move you, because you can relate to that. It could be someone that you may have known, or a friend of a friend, um, and you can take a different perspective at the event. And that's really what, uh, something that we, we believe we can build a better information system by giving people the opportunity to better feel what's happening on this planet, whether it's in Pakistan, whether it's ne next door. Um, another good example, just a year ago, when Steve Jobs passed away, uh, you know, you have all those, those articles, of course, about Steve Jobs. Um, but then another different perspective is the social perspective. What, you know, what the, the people who work with Steve, what did they have to say that day? Um, and again, you're probably not following in your, you know, on Twitter, on Facebook, uh, Apple on Praise, but news organizations, journalists, and, 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 and users of Storyfy, they do. And they put together stories, and for example, they, they, they catch that tweet from an employee of Apple who was saying, I feel sick and my heart is pounding. Everything about this is heartbreaking. And that was done by the Daily Beast, which is uh, a Newsweek from mm -hmm. the United States. And so 
that's really the, the vision of Storyfy, is how can we really surface the voices that matter, the voices that you would never have heard of unless someone was actually surfacing that voice to tell you the story and give you another perspective. Um, it can also apply for technology. When Instagram got bought for uh, one billion dollar, um, you could have an expert on social network who, who, who can say like interesting thing. Giving up one percent of your market cap to take a biggest threat is a savvy move. Uh, or it could be for funny things like this guy. Facebook buys Instagram for one billion dollar. Idiots! They could have donated it for free. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really the the goal, the mission of Storyfy is now that we live on this planet where whatever is happening, um, there always going to be someone who's going to share what's going on. They're always going to have, you're always going to have access to the best expert on this planet. We're going to share really interesting information. How can we make sure that we can surface that so that we can make the world smarter? Um, but not only smarter, but also with more empathy because we can feel closer to the event. And, um, yeah, I'm not going to go through this. You can go online and we have this great iPad app. Uh, but basically now users, we, we now have 22 out of 25 US news sites uh, from CNN to the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and many more. But also internationally, we have uh, the BBC, The Guardian. Uh, in Belgium, we have The Tate, The Soir, and, and others. Um, and all around the world, we have a lot of news organizations using Storyfy. Uh, but also organizations. We have um, the White House using Storyfy, the campaign of Barack Obama and Mitt Romney are using Storyfy as well. We had uh, Sarkozy and uh, Francois Hollande who used Storyfy for the election last year. Um, and also uh, uh, organizations like uh, United Nations, brands, Disney, and so on and so forth. Because the thing is that even those brands and organizations, they also want to amplify the voices that matter. And for them, the voices that matter are the voices of their best customers uh, who say great things about those brands or about Barack Obama or Mitt Romney and they want to make sure that those voices don't get lost in the social media noise but get amplified and can reach wide audiences. And for that, Storyfy is a great tool. So plenty of different stories, uh, news of course, events, conferences, all the TEDx events are using Storyfy. Uh, to capture the best food that people are sharing on social media. Uh, debates, memes, you know, when there is a meme, like on the internet, we love the internet for the memes. You know, you can create a lot of funny stuff um, about that. And now the elections also in, in, in Belgium, like there's a lot of memes with those politicians. Um, and so yeah, brand monitoring, content marketing. So there is a lot of different use cases where you really want to be able to create information from different streams and put that together in a story that you can amplify. So our story of Storyfy, we launched, we first launched a private beta at TechCrunch Disrupt exactly two years ago. Uh, that was in 2010. Um, and then soon after that, uh, by the end of the year, uh, we raised $2 million with Cosula Ventures, which is a top tier VC in Silicon Valley. Cosula, Vinod Cosula is, uh, was the co-founder of Sun Microsystem. Um, who was a huge success and now is managing a, a $2 billion fund. Um, we won the South by Southwest Accelerator. South by Southwest, for whom doesn't know it, uh, it's like really a large, probably the largest startup event in the United States. And uh, the web mission has been, uh, went there last year, it was a lot of fun. Um, and, and you should go to it, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, so we, we, we launched publicly the platform in April. Um, so after being in private beta for a couple of months. Um, and then actually this year we won again the South by Southwest uh, Interactive Award this time along with Pinterest. Um, so that was cool. Um, our team, we are um, eight people uh, in San Francisco, but we also have like, some uh, people working remotely uh, in Canada and, and, and Switzerland, uh, coming from different backgrounds, Stanford, Yahoo, um, associated press uh, and so on. And really the goal of Storyfy again is to build an information network for the social web. You know, what's, what's the equivalent of, of Yahoo or Google for the social web? What, where do you go if you want to know what people are saying about the elections right now in Belgium? You are not going to search on Twitter, it's way too noisy. You are not going to search on Instagram, it's really difficult. Uh, same thing on YouTube. And so Storyfy is all about building this information network so that we can all 
have the social <coughs> perspective on whatever is happening either next door or in Syria or Pakistan or wherever that is. So that's really where Storyfy is today. And, um, and so just to give you some numbers, um, so last month we grew like about more than 20% month over month now. We reached 24 million story views last month. Um, and it's being like, yeah, embedded everywhere, which is, which is really great. It doesn't go without pain. Like there is a lot of, you know, we are working hard on making sure the system can scale. Uh, and, and we grow like, yeah, I mean, uh, it, those things are really well. I can talk about that as well if you want to, but I'll leave that to the questions afterwards. I guess like, the main question for, for this audience here is how did I get there? Um, and there is really like, I love this saying that says, it takes time to become an overnight success. Uh, someone said that, I don't know who, uh, someone. Uh, and I like that, no, because we, we, we all uh, look at TechCrunch and those kind of blogs and we see like this startup just raised that much money and so on and, and it all feels like, oh wow, I mean, you never heard about that startup and all of a sudden they raised millions of dollars and, and they, or they got bought or whatever, but the truth is that behind that every of those stories, there is a story <coughs> of founders who have spent years, literally years, before getting where they, where they are now. Uh, Pinterest, the latest huge success lately, I mean, they've been working for three years be, uh, below the radar uh, before you know, getting the traction they have. Tumblr, same thing, three, two and a half years before they start being noticed. Um, Instagram, that we just mentioned, they've been working on another startup just before and they had to shut it down and they had to rework everything and they've been also working for more than two years. Uh, before getting there, so um, so it takes time, and um, actually for me it's actually started like I've always been passionate about media and technology as I said, uh, and it started in 1994, <coughs> so I was 10, uh, and back then I was uh, cutting and pasting my dad newspaper and selling that to family, friends, and friends for 20 Belgian franc uh, for doing my first newspaper slash magazine. And then from there, we actually grew it into a 30,000 circulation magazine across Belgium uh, that was financed by advertising. Um, and uh, we also partnered with Microsoft. And the whole vision of the, maga of the Tribal magazine uh, was to enable young people to be published. Um, you know, it was before blogs existed. So at that time, it was really difficult for young people to, to make their voice heard. And so that's, that's why we did that. Um, after that, I turned the software that I built, um, since I've always been also into technology as an engineer myself, uh, I built the underlying infrastructure and then I turned into a company to, uh, to sell the software uh, for SMEs in Belgium. Um, and then I did another project, Europa Tweets, um, which was all about um, kind of showing the member of the European Parliament who were on Twitter. Um, so also, all the time, like, I always look for ways for how can we amplify voices that are not being heard enough? Uh, then in 2008, I presented at the Beta Group, and what I presented, if Jean remembers, uh, Where is Jean? <laughs> uh, if you remember, it was Twitter. Uh, and the whole idea was, the f was to, to build the first discovery engine with automatic tagging of public tweets. Um, and so the whole idea was again, so I was a really early user of Twitter in 2006, and I quickly realized that, wow, there is a lot of crap here, but there is also a lot of good content. You know, when you have people like Tim O'Reilly or, or even Barack Obama now on Twitter, um, how can we make sure that, you know, mass audiences can get to see that? And so that was the first kind of idea around that, uh, that first iteration around that idea. Um, and it was like, yeah, featured on TechCrunch, Washington Post, PC World. Um, that was a lot of fun, but it wasn't making any money, and I was in Belgium, and and so we had to pivot and find a way to make money because uh, it wasn't really possible to raise money uh, with that. But that was kind of the first uh, Twitter-related application. Um, then I moved to, uh, to San Francisco three years ago. Uh, and, and so back then, like, I mean, actually, let me roll back just a bit. Uh, so with Twitter, cool project, buzz in the nerd industry, <laughs> but it wasn't making any money. So looking for ways to make money, and so I look around and I said, okay, who would be interested in making sense of social media and publishing it? And with my background in, in media and publishing, I directly looked at uh, media companies, and indeed they were interested, and that's how I actually started uh, 
what became public tweet for publishing Twitter and uh, Belacom Scanet was the very first client and then quickly after that the swap on Bayer dot be um, use, use it as well. Um, and then I tried to raise money first in Belgium, raised $25,000 uh, thousand euros uh, in Belgium with angels here um, for 25% of the company. Um, so that's, that's a lot. Um, and, and so I tried to raise more money because of, of you see 25,000 euros is not a lot, um, but that was just impossible. Um, people here, I tried here in Brussels, I tried in Paris, and the feedback was always the same, which is basically that uh, I first need to prove a business model and show that it works before they can invest money. And I said, uh, it's kind of a chicken and egg problem because you actually need the money to do that demonstration. Uh, but anyway, I think that is really the, the European mentality, which is show me that you have uh, that you have a business, that it works, and we're going to put more money so that you can sell to more people or to bigger markets. But you first need to show that you have something that works. Um, and obviously, all of those things, I mean, back then, Twitter was still like really a niche product. So something on top of Twitter was definitely a niche of a niche, so really hard to justify for angels here, uh, or VCs, to put money uh, in. So I uh, moved to the United States um, three years ago, uh, and so back then, so yeah, we didn't know anybody there. So we had to start again from scratch, and the very first angel that, that, we, that we met, uh, and I met with my, my wife, she can remember that, um, that uh, the very first angel told us, um, yeah, this is interesting, but uh, uh, my best advice would be go back to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we, we just moved. <laughs> sure, we consider that. Uh, and, and so, so yeah, it was, it was hard. And, and this point was, well, I mean, you already have Le Soir, you already have Le Monde, Le Monde was using it. Um, you know the European market better than you know the, the US market. You're going to take much longer here to be successful. Um, and so, started working and, and, and you know, trying to get the San Francisco Chronicle, which is the equivalent of the Soir uh, in San Francisco, to use the product. And, and it was hard, you know, I was nobody, so uh, it was really, really hard. So, one thing, um, one day I was really tired of that and, and just like, okay, let's do something different. Um, and so I did, in, in 24 hours, I pretty coded this listy monkey thing. <laughs> but basically, it was a simple product that was just about monitoring uh, uh, Twitter for keywords, um, and I would send you an email uh, directly. And quickly after that, uh, got uh, yeah, Mashable, TechCrunch, and and other influencer in the industry talking about it. And so that was great because it made it made my name known in the industry uh, in San Francisco. So it was helpful, and and that way I actually got to present my next product, which was Public Tweet. Uh, I got the opportunity to present at different meetups in San Francisco because with this other hackathon hack I quickly did, uh, people saw that I, I was able to do interesting things. So then comes Public Tweet. And, um, and so it took me, at the end, like we, we gave ourselves like six months in San Francisco uh, to go to San Francisco and have a, somehow a sign that we were on, the good, on a good way to, to, to make something uh, here. Um, otherwise, we'll just go back to Belgium and, all right, uh, and just continue. Um, and so after, after five months and after a lot of, um, um, like, you know, um, trying to meet the San Francisco, San Francisco Chronicle and meeting plenty of entrepreneurs and, and having coffee left and right, um, finally got a call from, from them saying that they were interested in using our product for free. But at least they were interested in using the product, which was great. And also at the same time, we got the very first investment from an American angel investor who put $10,000, um, which is really not a lot, but for, for us it was really a sign that, okay, we are, you know, we are to something. At least if an American guy is, is, is trusting us enough to uh, give this random dude from Belgium $10,000, um, it means that, okay, we have at least something to work on. Uh, and so, the, so what I realized, so after that, so when we come back after Christmas to the US, we, 
I mean, I quickly realized that, okay, this is great, but I'm, I'm not going to go anywhere if it takes me five months to get uh, every new customer, a new client, user. And so I was looking for a co-founder, an American co-founder, to help me, you know, get that to the next level. Uh, and, and so that's why I was presenting Tori Tweet uh, in all different meetups, um, like this one, like the Beta Group, basically, in San Francisco. And that's how I eventually met my co-founder, Bert Herman, uh, who was also really passionate about the same space. And that's how we started working together. Um, and then by living there, um, you know, started making friends, found an office space uh, with the, guy, the guys from Cloud that I knew when there were still only two guys in, in the Starbucks. Uh, and now there are like 100 people now, it's a big company, Cloud. And so we are sub renting with them an office space in the same building as Twitter. Um, and so thanks to that, when the Washington Post came to talk to Twitter to do the very first promoted trend for the for, I don't remember what event back then. Uh, it was really easy for them to just stop at, on the first floor uh, to go meet us. And they were really interested in what we were doing. And that's how, you know, you get, you know, be, be, by being at the right time, at the right place, it can really make a big, can really make a big, big difference. And having said that, uh, and although the numbers of people using public tweet was growing and the number of page views was growing by quite a lot, we saw, looking at the metrics, that the people actually were not really engaged. The whole concept of public tweet is, was only about publishing Twitter and in real time. And so the only feature we did that we would provide is making sure that um, you could select only the person that, that you allow to be published on your site and also whenever they would mention the defined keyword. So that was really basic. Uh, but still, people were interested. Um, and so, what we saw is that, okay, even though the publishers were interested and more people were installing it, we saw that the end user wasn't really engaging a lot with that. And so, we, we really think hard, and, and, and we started adding more and more features to the tweet, and uh, oh, it would be good to be able to pin a tweet at the top so that it stays at the top, and then, oh, it would be good if we could favorite one and, and you know, and add different rules like that. But then, your products start being cluttered, where you add a lot, a lot of features, and, and now it becomes really hard to, 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 to use, to, to tell people like, how to use it, to tell people what is that for. Uh, it becomes really a bulky product. And so we went back on the drawing table, and, and we thought about, okay, what, you know, we should re-engineer that. We should think about a better way to publish the content from social media. And, um, and that's how we, we ended up um, uh, Changing the concept of not publishing Twitter, not publishing only Twitter in real time, but actually giving more power to the publisher and and give them the power to manually choose uh, which social object, which tweet they would want to publish, and also provide context. And since we wanted to do that, to do that not only on top of Twitter, but also on top of Facebook and YouTube and so on, we also had to change the name, and that's how we stumbled upon Storyfy. And that's how we switch from public tweet to Storyfy. Um, and I love this saying that says, um, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry tweeted that in 1939. <laughs> um, Perfection is finally attained not when there is no longer anything to add, but when there is no longer anything to take away. And I really love that saying. Um, and, and really, because as a startup founder and as a product person, you, you release your first product and as always, it doesn't get the traction that you think it's going to get from day one. Uh, because everybody believes that just by releasing your product, everybody's going to was waiting for you and, and only analyzing your product from day one. And then it takes time and then people have requests and, and you add, start adding features and changing your product. And then really it becomes a product that is fine-tuned for, for this user or this user. But now for any newcomer, any new user, it becomes something much more difficult to, to get used to. Um, and so thinking about how can you remove friction, how can you make it really, really easy. Um, and in our case, what really made a big difference and also compared to competitors uh, who were trying to do the same thing was really the ease of use of our interface. Is that instead of having like interfaces where you had to use buttons and, and things, you could use drag and drop to just move one object from a string to a story. And that's really a powerful concept to make the interface much simpler uh, and, and start adding gestures um, to make complex tasks really easy. So, 
The, so we started building, uh, I think I wrote the first line of code in, in end of May 2009. Um, is that correct? Yeah. Um, and, and so it took basically a month before having a first prototype that we were able to show to uh, the LA Times, uh, where we were traveling south with Bert. Um, and they quickly loved it, and, uh, and they, were, they, were, they started using it, and uh, we were able to iterate with that feedback, and with that prototype, we were selected with TechCrunch Disrupt, and, and then the rest, uh, you know, as I presented to you earlier. Um, the thing we need that, that was really important um, in the success of Storyfy was definitely first this thinking in terms of what can we remove, how can we make this interface really, really simple. Um, but then the other thing is also like really uh, that startups funders don't think much enough about is the problem of distribution. Um, is the fact that it's not only be it's not because you have a product that people are going to start using it. Uh, and even if you have a product that people want to start using it, if you don't think about the distribution, uh, if you don't have access to a network of people who are really representative, who are influencers in the target market that you are targeting, you're really going to have a hard time. Um, and, and the reason for that really is because like, the best marketing is the, the word of mouth. It's someone who's going to tell you, like, hey, you need to do this, you should use that. Uh, that's the best marketing out there. Uh, and to convince the first person, you not only have to have a great product, but you also need to be legit to that person. Now, if one of us then tomorrow I come up with a great product to do accountability, <coughs> you know, who am I? I mean, I don't have any experience in accountability, so if I'm going to go to a conference about all the contents and I'm going to do a presentation about that, people are going to look at me and say, like, who is this guy? I'm not going to trust him that this product is the one I should use. Um, and so it's going to be really hard and you're going to have a lot of friction to be able to get your product to the market. But now if one of your co-founder is actually someone who wrote books about accountability, uh, uh, bookkeeping and things like that, and is someone who, who is known in that community, then it's going to be an entirely different story. Because then that person is going to talk about, hey, we have built this great new product and you should give it a try. People are going to believe that person um, and it's going to be really easy to get your, your product out the door. And so that's something that's really important. Uh, a few, before leaving it to, uh, to question and answers, um, I just have a few reflections because something like uh, I've been asked a lot um, about Belgium and angels and, and all of those kind of things. So we go through those five of them. Uh, really quickly and you can ask questions. Um, so first, you can't make a global co internet company out of Belgium, but you can contribute. Um, I always say like in the same way that our parents uh, used to leave the countryside to go to the capital city to do business or to find a job, um, this is the exact same thing in our generation. It's just that I showed you at the beginning that like, we are all connected, we are all living on one planet, and it's as easy to go from Bastogne to Brussels uh, as it is to go from Brussels to San Francisco nowadays. And so if your goal is really to make a, especially a consumer startup and you target the global market, you better be in the capital city of your industry. So if your industry is aeronautic, you better be in Toulouse. If your industry is robotic, you probably need to be in Tokyo. Um, if you are about music, Berlin is a really good place. And if you are about a web startup, you probably we need to be in San Francisco, uh, or at least have someone there. Uh, because that's where all the people are. And um, that's where you know, the best engineers who just worked on, on scalability issues at Twitter are, and can teach you good things uh, to scale your product. Or where the people working on the growth of Facebook and the variety of Facebook, uh, they are all there as well. Um, and so being able to access to this pool of people uh, it's something that is really useful that you really need to be able to grow your company at those, at those, at those scale. <laughs> now having said that, you can still stay here and contribute to those companies. Um, in the same way like, for example, I know that Belgium and the Netherlands are actually the, the top ranking on Dribbble, which is this website for designers. Um, and so that kind of, uh, um, yeah, here like, Greg is, is, is one of them, uh, really great Belgian designer. 
Um, and so there are like areas of expertise that you can develop uh, and stay here. And because we are all connected, you can still work for uh, Silicon Valley companies, startups, or uh, remotely uh, in different ways. There's also like uh, Benjamin de Kock, uh, who is working for Stripe, uh, who is a really great startup, and, and I think is, is traveling there like every once in a while, uh, but still, still based in Belgium. So there's definitely ways you can, you can contribute, uh, which is great. Um, but also, like, I'm, I mean, also, you really need the very first question you need to ask yourself is what really you are passionate about, what you really want to do. Uh, doing a startup is really hard, um, and you know, it takes time to become an overnight success, and there's a lot of up and down. The only reason why we're going to continue with all the downs is because you are passionate about what you do, and you really want to succeed. If you just want to go after an opportunity just for the money or just for whatever, then you know once you're gonna get the better opportunity, you're just gonna stop doing it. And the what's really important for entrepreneurs is, I mean, if you you, you are really you persevere, uh, you really keep working hard on your stuff, you're gonna be successful. Um, there is really like it's a matter of of, of continuing and be um, and having a lot of perseverance. Uh, but if you wait, what you really want to do, for example, is a B2B company, then you should better stay here. Because doing a B2B company is, requires a lot of trust between, between partners, uh, and it takes months to make a deal happen. Uh, and if you go to the United States, you are, again, nobody there, and it's going to take a lot of time for you to gain the trust of people. And you're going to take, like, like me, I took six months to get the San Francisco Chronicle to, to sign the deal, and after I got my co-founder, it took us a meeting to get the LA Times uh, to use it. Um, and, and the reason for that is because it's natural. You know, when you talk to someone and you can share, you can, you, someone who, who went to the same school as you, or watched the same TV shows, or is also a fan of baseball or whatever, you have something to talk about. And it really helps building trust much more easily than if tomorrow someone from whatever, you know, country, let's take Tajikistan or, or whatever comes to you and, and you know and trying to sell you something it's natural so uh, you need to be aware of that uh, now one thing that a lot I hear a lot of uh, European entrepreneurs talking about is the lack of angels here uh, and indeed like the number of angels in, in Silicon Valley is like crazy uh, there's a lot of money flowing uh, there and the reason for that is because like all those big successes Google Facebook Apple and so on are all there and all the first dozen hundred employees uh, become millionaire and they have plenty of money and they want to pay back in a way and so they invest in startups um, and there is a lot of that going on there that doesn't exist here uh, the biggest problem I see for angels investor in Belgium in Europe in general is that there is there is only two possible outcomes with startups here either you become profitable either you die. Whereas in the United States, Silicon Valley specifically, uh, you have three, a third option, which is being bought by another bigger company. Uh, and, and actually that happens quite often. I mean, if you are successful, somewhat successful, that, that happens quite often, which means that for angel investors, there is a much higher chance to get their money back. Um, and here it doesn't happen. You know, if at the best case scenario, you're gonna be profitable, but then if you are profitable, Actually, in Silicon Valley, they don't want you to be that profitable because they would rather have you being bought by another company so they can get their money back faster. Because if you stop raising money and if you become profitable, then the only way you're gonna pay back your investors is by giving them a dividend or, or things like that, but it's gonna take years and years and years before uh, they're gonna see their money back. Um, and so that's a big problem. So how do we solve that? Well. It's great, and that's why I love the Beta Co-work and Beta Group. It's great to see like non-young people are starting to build new companies again. This is really fantastic. Um, and so that was kind of the first step, which is how can we motivate young people to to stop going to work for big institutions, banks, and all of those uh, soon to be disrupted, hopefully, uh, institutions. <laughs> uh, but then the second step is how can we convince the old guys uh, who are making decisions at big companies such as Vagacom, Movistar, Telenet, um, who else, Electra Bell, I don't know, to take, a, take a name. Uh, we need to convince them to buy one startup a year. If you do that, imagine if any of those companies would sell up at the beta group, you know, at the beginning of the year. 
Uh, there will be a lot of young entrepreneurs, engineers, designers working together to build great startups. Uh, addressing market needs because they have the hope to be to be bought by one of those companies, um, and then it also means that they're going to be a market for angel investors, and you know people will be more willing to take risks because they will have that new outcome. So uh, that's something we need to make happen one way or another. I don't know what is the best way to do that, but uh, if you have an uncle or grandparents. Uh, uh, grand grandparents who are <laughs> working at those companies, uh, yeah, please, please try to convince them to do that. I think it's good for them too because really you cannot make innovation happen with people who are working at those companies from nine to five. You need to have young people who are passionate about what they do to really push the needle. Uh, and I think everybody has to win in that. Mm. The other thing is to dream big. I mean, in Belgium, we, we tend to dream really small because uh, we know we, we, we want to get the Belgium market. I mean, the what market? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Belgium is like 10 million people speaking three different languages, um, not even able to get along all the time together. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not a market, uh, you know? I mean, at best, there is the French-speaking market, there is the English-speaking market, there is the Dutch-speaking market. Uh, but like, just forget about this idea of countries. I mean, those countries are things from the past. We, they don't make sense anymore in a world where we are all, again, we are all connected. Uh, there is no borders anymore, it doesn't matter. So you just need to work, go work with the best people out there that can help you move the needle. And that can be, that means, you know, that may mean working with a guy from Germany, from Italy, from, you know, whenever. And that's a great thing that we have also in Brussels, that actually there's a lot of people from all around the world here. Um, and also to think about the market is like, no, no, what is, it's not limited by borders. So you need to dream big. And it also means that when you are raising money, don't raise 25,000 euros. Uh, no, go, go shoot for raising, you know, half a million, minimum. Because one thing important to know, and, and especially um, in, in Silicon Valley is, uh, you know, VCs will always want, and, and angels will always want to get like more like 20 to 30 percent of your company. Uh, but so, if you only raise, if you raise like 100,000 euros uh, or 500,000 euros, the difference in equity they're gonna take in your company is roughly gonna be roughly the same. So it's much better to actually raise much more money um, because it's gonna drive the valuation of your company up. Um, and then it will also give the message to investors <coughs> that you are not here to target the Brussels market. That you are here to target a much larger market, that you want to do something much bigger than just doing a small application uh, just for you and your friends. Uh, don't listen to your mom. Uh, I love my mom, uh, but she wasn't, you know, she wasn't so excited for me to go to another country. Um, and, and I think like, the reason for that is because uh, your relatives, the people who love you, they don't want the best for you, they want, uh, they want you to be safe. And it's kind of normal, um, it's natural. And that's why you know, in Belgium, like, being successful in Belgium means getting a job and being an employee, because there is no safest position than that. Um, you know, you get your car, you get your salary every month, they take care of everything for you. Uh, you are going to be safe. But the truth is that a safe job is also a boring job. And if you're really passionate about something, if you want to achieve something and learn a lot, you better you know, follow your, your heart, your passion, and do what you really want to do. And especially, especially if you just get out of university, and come on, I mean, out of my promotion in, in Louisiana Nerve of those guys, you know, with an uh, engineering degree, that like they could find a job anywhere, and they would just work for, you know, ING and Swift and Canada, and, and that was just before the economic crisis, uh, and that was supposed to be a safe job. And, and I mean, come on, I mean, this is a time in your life where you really, you know, before you get a family and stuff, you can really take a lot of risk. Uh, so take the opportunity to do that, and just follow what you're really passionate about, and if you keep going, you're going to end up finding the right opportunities um, and do something that you love, which is really the most important thing. And then, share. Uh, like way too often, uh, and especially with European entrepreneurs, uh, 
they would talk to me and they would say like, yeah, uh, so I had this idea, but I cannot talk to you about it because I'm too afraid that you know someone's gonna steal it. Uh, you know, uh, you know uh, those kind of things. I mean, this is plain wrong. This is totally plain wrong, and I tell you why. Uh, first, because the only people who can turn an idea into reality are called entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurs, uh, most likely, they already have their own ideas. And it's natural to think that your own ideas are better than someone else's ideas. So, uh, you know, they would rather work on their own ideas than rather to work on your idea. That's the first thing. Uh, then the second thing is, once you launch your product anyway, I mean, anybody can look online and play with your product. Um, or, you know, in this world where everybody, everything is connected, in this world of WikiLeaks and all of these things, I mean, it's really, you cannot really hide things anymore. And so one day or another, people will get to see what you're working on, and that would be easy to take a look. Um, but then most importantly is the fact that today, the best product didn't, um, didn't become a great product from day one. People were iterating, keep working on them to make it better. And the only way you can make it better and iterate on your product is by getting feedback from people. And the only way you're gonna get feedback from people is by talking to people and sharing your ideas. And so if you compare two persons, um, because yeah, by the way, we are one billion people connected. I, I really have a hard time to believe that your idea, you have the only one on one billion people who have the same idea. That just probability, probabilistically speaking, doesn't make sense. Uh, so let's say that two people have the same idea at the same time. One person is sharing with everybody they meet and the other is not sharing. Well, the person is going to share a lot, going to get a lot of feedback and improve the product a lot and then launch. Um, the person who doesn't share, doesn't get any feedback, doesn't get opportunities to get validation and improve and the product is never going to be as good. So please share. Uh, I love this, this saying that says, um, hackers uh, are able to accomplish so much in so little time because they come from a community that's built upon sharing knowledge. You know, there's all this open source community and stuff, and that's how we can build great stuff, is by building on one another, and everyone can add their own added value, and everyone has the opportunity to not having to reinvent the wheel, uh, which is, you know, a terrible idea for humanity, reinventing the wheel. Um, and so if you share, we can all learn from everyone's experience, and we can all get better um, and do a better job. So. So those are kind of my reflection. Uh, I just want to end up before um, then giving the mic to you um, by saying that this is really an amazing time that we are really fortunate to live uh, in this time of history where we not only everybody is connected, but also <laughs> like we have access to the mean of production. You know, parents had to go to a big office <coughs> to have access to technology. People didn't have computers at home. They had to go to a big office uh, to be able to use computers. Now we can all have a laptop and a smartphone and have access to this entire internet and build stuff. You know, build iPhone apps, uh, Android apps, and websites, and so on. I mean, this is an amazing time to be. And we need to take the opportunity um, to use that, what we have at our disposal, to change things and to disrupt those big institutions that need disruption uh, so that we can build a better planet, sharing more knowledge, and uh, giving the ability to everyone, you know, from India to Africa to remote places, um, to be able to access that knowledge and also contribute to it um, and, and improve the world. So I love finishing my presentation with this slide uh, that says, uh, now that we are in this digital world, go excite some electrons and change the world. Thank you. Are there questions for Xavier? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I'd like to know how did you manage to survive when you arrived in the Bay Area? Did you have savings or? How did I survive in the Bay Area? Yeah. Um, how did you eat? How did you uh, rent an apartment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I didn't have to buy a gun. <laughs> uh, this is not Texas. Um, so no, I had savings. Um, 
I worked for, for a year before that uh, in London as a consultant. And the good thing about working as a consultant in a different country is that um, you, you, you can make some money uh, uh, on the side. Um, uh, having said that, I mean, the very first year we were really living on the, on the cheap. I mean, we, we were sharing one bathroom for five people. Um, don't worry, we still had the opportunity to take a shower. Uh, and, um, and yeah, I don't remember, like, the end of the, our burn rate uh, was, what about, three, 25, 25 a month for two people. Living in San Francisco, eating, it's cheap. Yes? Um, in your story, uh, you immediately went for your clients as a big, uh, big publishers, and how did you come up with that these were your customers? And not the users as compared to, for example, Facebook or Twitter? Uh, the, um, I mean, we, we, we kind of, I mean, at one point, I mean, it's, it's not clear. Um, you know, because at one point we really wanted to have like everybody to, to create stories, uh, and then we realized that it takes some work to be able to search, you know, curate, publish, um, and so end users would still. And we have some users who use Storyfy for for weddings, for example, where a lot of all the guests are sending pictures and on, on social media, and then they don't want that to be lost and they want they use Storyfy uh, to do that. So we have some end users doing that. But the truth is, those guys will do it once or twice a year. I mean, usually you get married only once, even in your lifetime. Uh, but then there are also other use cases when you go to a conference and things like that. Uh, but so what we realized that the heavy users will be those big publishers, will be those journalists who actually, whose job is to tell their audience what's going on. And all journalists are all on Twitter uh, monitoring what's being said there, um, and so we knew that those are going to be the heavy users. And then, also from a marketing perspective, we also knew that those were the most influential people. That's also something that you really want to do when you have a new product, is you want to target first the, I mean, once you're ready, the influential people. Um, and so now being able to be embedded on CNN.com, it's a great opportunity for a brand to be seen by everybody. Let's go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so a bit about the money, but how easy was it to, for you to meet the SF community? To find an office space, to find a house to rent, to, find, to meet uh, business people? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah that's a so the... Um, the um, so easy and not easy is the answer. Um, I mean, the great thing about San Francisco and Silicon Valley overall is this concept of uh, uh, of forward payback. And the concept is that people realize that if they are successful, it's not only thanks to them, but also because other people uh, made that possible. Uh, other people who were helping them getting an introduction <coughs> or giving them advice um, or office space and so on. And so, and at that time, when you, someone else is helping you, uh, you, you are nobody, so you cannot really help them. You're not going to pay them uh, a lunch. I mean, they, have, they are much more rich than you are. Uh, and you're not going to introduce them to anyone because your network is, is really no existing. Uh, and they say, like, no, it's fine. You don't need to pay me back. You're going to pay forward. Which means that once you're also going to be successful, um, you're also going to help and pay forward and give advice and, and so on. And that's an amazing thing because it's really a great thing that that make it so that you really have access to this experience and knowledge base and you know that can lift you up. So that's great. Now having said that, there's still like, it's a bit like Hollywood, uh, where there are all those people who want to be an actress uh, and, and you need to, you know, like sift through the noise and, and get to see who really has talent. Uh, and so there's some of that happening now in Silicon Valley as well, where there's too many people trying to, to make it there. Um, and so, the way I saw that problem was with this listy monkey thing that was just a quick hack but just that was needed by the community. Um, and so that's one thing that, uh, and I made the mistake too, which is like you go there, you have your ID in mind, and you think that your ID is the best, and 
and you think that they're gonna love it and they're gonna start using it straight away and stuff. But uh, the truth is, reality is really different there and your better bet is to actually go open-minded there and just know what are you passionate about and what is your target community and try to meet them and try to, instead of pitching them your idea, just start listening to them. Ask them, what keeps you awake at night? Uh, and then they're gonna start talking about your, their problems. And then you'll see, like, at one point, you'll see, like, you'll find out, aha, uh -huh, that's kind of close enough to what I was doing. But if I change my product slide to be that way, that will be totally it. And that's how <coughs> you are most likely to be able to iterate and pivot and make your product successful. And so that's basically what I did with Visty Monkey, which is like, I stopped working on my forcing people to, to hear my pitch and my way of thinking, and I start listening. And I said, like, how? You think that would be useful? Well, I can do that in 24 hours. And then just did it. Um, and that, you know, like that way I was able to uh, get some press and it was easier um, to get there. So make you useful to your community. <laughs> Questions here. Yeah, yes, you, you raised a certain amount of money to develop the website. How did you decide to, to, to raise that particular amount and not more? And uh, how did you use it afterwards? What was it? Yeah. What was your bigger cost? Marketing or? Um, so we didn't want to raise two million dollars at the beginning. Uh, we just wanted to raise half a million, and then um, and then we said that we, we talked to uh, an angel who was willing to put 50k, and we refused because the valuation wasn't high enough for us. Um, and then we got access to that VC. Uh, but then for the VC, they don't care about putting half a million dollars, they want to put more than that. So they basically told us like, hey guys, why don't you raise two million dollars? And we said, like, okay. <laughs> uh, and, and the thing is, because again, like a VC is always gonna take another the same percentage of the company. So whether you, if you raise like one or two million, uh, really roughly it was the same. Um, so that's why, that's why we ended up raising two million dollars. Uh, but those, those things are kind of, you know, like how much money you really need, it's really, uh, I mean, the higher cost is engineering. Um, hiring engineers in Silicon Valley is bloody expensive, uh, and that's your number one cost. Uh, really, I mean, marketing was mainly word of mouth. Um, so do you need more money now? I mean, we always need more money, you know? <laughs> we, we can do much more. Uh, with more money. I mean, we don't need to raise money right now, but we're probably going to raise money uh, early next year. Um, the For what? <laughs> yeah. Two months, no? Two months. Uh, one, one thing at a time. Yeah? Good. How do you monetize Good. the product like this? Sorry? Uh, you have the money raised. How do you monetize it? How do you make money? How do we make money? Um, so right now, we start experimenting with, with different things. Um, so up to now we are still pro revenue, um, and, and you see that a lot of consumer app and things like that. I mean, they tend to do this kind of strategy where they just put the product out there for free, get usage, and then start charging people. Um, and so that's kind of the same thing. I mean, we have basically two ways to, we can go. Uh, the first way is a classic freemium model where some people will pay for pro services uh, because when you have like really big organization, they want to give you money because they want to make sure that they can call you if there is a problem or whatever. Um, and now that we became the leader in the social curation space, they want to work with us. Um, so that's that's the one first obvious way. Uh, and then a second interesting way is also like what about we talk more and more about social advertising, uh, and there is different interesting things to explore there. And so we are working on those different, uh, those different ideas. So one question here, then. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, I work in sales for a software company. And uh, you mentioned upon uh, in your presentation about the distribution aspects, which is something that startups don't usually consider that much at the beginning. You have like, bigger problems. So you, you mentioned the word of mouth. You mentioned that uh, marketing and promotion is made mostly by you know, talking to people and people in your network. But is there any other uh, advice, any tips you would uh, like give to startups when it comes to the distribution to like selling your product? I think uh, you said that, this that at the beginning of the startup, like distribution is not there, they have a bigger problem. Uh, I don't agree with that. Okay. I think that your bigger problem is distribution. Okay. Uh, because otherwise you end up, like when you start up building a product that nobody uses. 
Uh, and you need to do like Bill Gates did, which is selling something that doesn't exist. Uh, you know, he talked to IBM and sold them an uh, operating system without having it. And just now they are, that is the validation thing. Um, the validation that they needed that and they start coding night and day and night uh, to do that. So I really think that you need in your, basically we used to say that the dream team to do a startup is you need to have three skills that can generally it's two or three people. Uh, it's never one, two or three people. And three skills that you need is distribution, um, user experience, uh, and technical uh, co-founder. So you need a technical co-founder, it's obvious because now all the products in whatever industry, you're always gonna have a web component, a technological component. <coughs> um, distribution is because you need to be able to know how, we know how you're gonna market it and, and who to talk to. Uh, but also the distribution person also knows really well the industry and knows the problems of the industry and helps making sure to be the right product. And then the user experience is really important because nowadays there are so many different startups doing the same kind of thing and the way you can um, differentiate yourself is through the user experience. And people really love, you know, like with Apple and all this kind of thing, that people are getting used to, you, to use like great designed product. Um, and you know, it's, it's the days of crappy interfaces are over and that's a good thing. Um, and so it's important. I mean, I really do believe that um, for a startup, so those three components of startup, like increasingly technology is becoming a commodity. You can hire engineers, uh, you know, from East Europe or India. Uh, design, in a way, start becoming com a commodity as well because we have Dribbble and all those kind of people and you can hire them also uh, remotely. What is not a commodity is the community using your product. And that's the very reason why you can copy paste Pinterest.com it doesn't matter. And many people have tried to do so, and they all have failed. Uh, because, you know, technology, yes, you can copy it. Design, yes, you can copy it. But you don't have the community who is making the product the product way it is. Um, and so community is super important. And to make that work, you need to have someone in your co-founders uh, into that community who understands it really well and knows how to communicate to them. You don't communicate to journalists the same way you communicate to salespeople. Um, and that's true for every single industry. So, yes, there was a question here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so assuming we have our product ready and we are ready to launch, uh, we would like to go to San Francisco. Who would we like to meet first? How would we start? How would we go in? Um, um, you mean with the goal of living there? Well, with the goal of uh, getting uh, to influential people, to get some press uh, talking about us, not investors yet, just uh, to get some noise and connections. Um, I mean, it's not easy because it's again a question of community. You know, when you meet someone for the first time, uh, you are nobody. When you are when there's a the third time that you meet someone, then the person starts noticing you, and uh, you know that you are much more likely to get their um, their interest. Um, I guess like maybe the best way is probably to go with the web mission, uh, which is um, I mean Ramon can talk to you about that. Uh, group of entrepreneurs going to Silicon Valley once a year, um, and so that they you go with other entrepreneurs. And for their influencer, like Robert Scover, or whoever that is, it's better for them to meet at once a couple of startups like yours than just you know meet you uh, in person. So that's a good way to start doing that. Uh, but then I would say like you know it's kind of a chicken and egg problem because you need to, in a way, you need to live there to be part of the community to really increase your chances to be noticed. And the events that they have, like startup events. And there is plenty every day, there are startup events is, is every way? single day. Is that, is that a good way to, to get noticed? And uh, yeah, I mean, it's a way to, uh, to definitely meet people. Um, so it's definitely something to do. Um, no, I would say, and in my case, it's not enough. Um, you, 
you really need to listen to go there to listen actually to their feedback and implement. Uh, Let's take two more yes. questions there and there. Yes, okay, go ahead there. Yeah. So um, I think it's very smart to look for um, a foreign uh, or foreign co-founder like, like you did for mm -hmm. like Cameron, but isn't it dangerous to start uh, alone like I think you did? Why didn't you look for a co-founder in Belgium first? Because you didn't know if it was going to grow so You know, I did, and I had actually uh, for Twitter, I yeah, had co-founders here. Um, and uh, but the thing is, they they weren't willing to take the same risk and go to uh, to, to San Francisco, and that wasn't going to stop me. Uh, so I went anyway. Um, I mean, still, I mean, uh, I think having co-founder is really really important because it's a lot of ups and downs, and the probability that you are all going to be down at the same time is much lower. So when you are down, the other can be up. Um, so that's something really important. Um, yeah. yeah. Question there, yeah? I'm going to build on this one and on that one. Yeah. My name is André Duval from the other advertising agency in Duval Guillaume previously. Yeah. So I followed in you. I had invested in Twitspark um, primarily <coughs> because it was done in Belgium, because they were going to go over there. Yeah. So I confirm what you said. It's like most of the agents are in Belgium. Isn't that there is money enough? And I'm not counting myself uh, one of those people that there's real money in Belgium. But um, as you said, there's only two options. You can lose all your money, or you can just hope that this company makes a big success, and then it's a long way before you see your money. So what you want is if you want to have uh, kind of a safe bet and a ride and help and, and bring some smart money. Yeah. So what I want to share maybe as a question to you, um, wasn't it be interesting to bring, I mean, a lot of people here might think that, yeah, we have to go to San Francisco, that's like a destination in itself. Yeah. So, uh, wouldn't it be interesting to bring more startups together and make a big jump together? So, um, I think there is, there, is a, there is a model possible of bringing from a low country or this country uh, different startups from different towns and different yeah. cities and different solutions <coughs> in a kind of a model that would be in itself an interesting uh, approach to, uh, to land and not only in San Francisco. The last question on that is, is I read a lot about New York uh, getting into the competition yeah. to go for a win out of San Francisco yeah. or against San Francisco to make counter offer yeah. on the East Coast. So go ahead. So, so first of all, thank you. Thank you for supporting a Belgian entrepreneurs. This is awesome. So thank you very much for that. Um, the <coughs> I mean, I think that um, there are multiple ways to look at the problem. Um, the first way is how can we solve the problem you mentioned about the exit opportunities in Belgium? And to me, the problem is what if companies like there is no reason why Twitspark couldn't be bought by Belgacom. Uh, that will never happen. But if there was a probability, then that would be a good investment, even if it wouldn't, have, it wouldn't go to San Francisco. Um, and so the question is, how can we motivate Belgacom to do those kind of things? Uh, then, knowing that that is not possible, so then there is what David do, did, uh, and which is awesome, which is going to San Francisco, having some angels even here, who accepted to play by the rules of San Francisco, which is not something that a lot of angels are willing to do, and I think this is great to do that. Um, because that's the risk, by the way. If you have money here from Belgium and from angels here in Belgium, by the Belgian rules, Belgian valuations, and you go to the United States and you try to raise money, they are not going to put money in your company. Because they will be scared. Like, who are those other people that I don't know? And they don't play by the same rules. So it's really important that either, like, and like you did, like, all, you get all your investors to be really flexible and to accept the rules that's going to be set by the American investors, uh, or that you don't just don't raise money here at all. Um, and then, like, if you go to, and then there is another a third. So there's also the second option, which so is going like Davi is doing, like I'm doing, uh, to San Francisco, um, and I think it's great. And there is the third option to me, which is looking at that as, um, as kind of an Erasmus. 
where, you know, instead, and I did it, I went to Madrid for my Erasmus and had a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> but instead of doing that, like, what if we would send our engineers one year to work as an intern in a San Francisco startup? They would, learn, they would learn a lot of things. And when they would come back, imagine if all the startups who presented the beta group, if in each of them, one guy would have a one year experience in Silicon Valley. Well, that will make a huge difference in what is going to be produced. Um, and so I understand that it can be like really hard to create a startup, and even more so when you go elsewhere like Silicon Valley. But as an engineer, if you don't want to do that, you can just go there uh, contribute, start working for those kind of companies, having an experience there, and make, you know, and help other startups here in Belgium to be successful. Um, now, when it comes to the thing that you are saying about like bringing multiple startups together uh, at the same time, there, um, I don't know. I mean, the French are doing it in uh, in in San Francisco, um, and they have those events. And they have an incubator there, Paris Soma. Um, I don't know. Um, and the thing is, it's maybe more philosophically speaking, but I'm against this, um, all those things that are being sponsored by the state, all the subsidies. Thank it's, you. It's, thank you. It's just a pita. Uh, and to me, like, don't take money from the government, please. Uh, this is counterproductive, and we can have a whole conversation about that if you want. Um, <laughs> and I didn't take any money from the government for Storyfy, and I'm proud of it. Um, but so, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm not so thrilled about that idea for whatever, for whatever reason. What I'm thrilled about is the idea that things like Y Combinator. Please do apply to Y Combinator. There is no reason why it's almost not mandatory for all the engineering and computer science in this country to apply to Y Combinator. I mean, you should do those kind of things. Um, and really, I think that, again, the same way I don't believe in countries, it doesn't make sense anymore. Like, you know, like going, putting together startups together. I don't know, maybe. In, oh. It's an interesting conversation. I don't know. I didn't think about it, but. Let's take a quick, very quick last question, and then we're finishing there. I'm sorry, you got so many questions there. Uh, um, people, so. you, <laughs> <have to mention, laughs> you also mentioned uh, earlier that the community basically makes and breaks today's products. Uh, I'm interested to know who do you see as your number one competitor at the moment, and uh, how do you see Storyfy actually? Because eventually, it seems that only one social sharing side of social uh, network will survive. Well, same with Twitter, same with Facebook. So do you think that Storyfy will be that one? Uh -huh. uh, I hope so. Um, so at the beginning of Storyfy, we had clear direct competitors um, who were doing really the exact same thing. And the reason why they didn't win is because in all the three skills, the only one had one ad, the, well, the only had one, thank you, uh, which was a technical skill. No user experience, no distribution. So quickly, people start using Storyfy more and more, and it's kind of the you know, network effect. You have the one winner takes it all, uh, and people will you know, start using Storyfy and stop using other products, and they have to shut down. Uh, now, and that's really a common pattern on the internet. You know, now everybody's in SoundCloud, everybody's in YouTube, and so on and so on. Uh, having said that, competitors are not the people who are doing the exact same thing as you do. The competitors are the people who are taking money from the same people that you want to take money from. And that's where uh, we are all like um, competing for the user attention. And the minute that you spend reading a story five stories are the minute that you don't spend on Facebook, on Twitter. Uh, or on YouTube, uh, or on other sites, or whatever. And so the question is, like, our competitors might be more people like, um, um, you know, Freeboard, or people 